Ladies and gentlemen, welcome aboard our Airbus A320. Please pay attention to illuminated signs and crew instructions including the following safety procedures. The safety card found in your seat pocket contains important information about exit routes, oxygen masks, life jackets, and the brace position, which you must adopt if you hear brace, brace. There are eight emergency exits on this aircraft. The cabin crew are now pointing out the exits nearest to you. Please be aware that your nearest usable exit may be behind you. Emergency lighting will guide you to an exit. In an emergency, leave all baggage on board. Your seatbelt is fastened, adjusted, and released as shown. It must be fastened whenever the seatbelt signs are on, and we recommend that you keep it fastened at all times. If the air supply fails, masks will drop from above you. Pull a mask towards you to start the oxygen. Put the mask over your nose and mouth and breathe normally. Hold the mask in place with the strap. Pull on each side to adjust. Put on your mask. All right, welcome back, everyone. It's been a while since we've done a feature review, and we thought this would be a great time to do one just to showcase version 2 block 2 and some of the features and changes that we've made to the aircraft. Now we're going to focus a little bit less on the art this time. There have already been previews of that in the past. Uh, what we're going to do instead is we're going to talk about uh, systems, avionics, uh, external engine model, and a bunch of new stuff that we haven't quite talked about just yet. So let's just jump straight into it and we'll begin with that intro that you just watched. Now that was not edited, it was not uh, put together just for this or to make that look nice. We've actually built a PA system uh, and we've gone quite in depth on it. So if you're sitting in the cabin, for example, there is sound attenuation from the speakers inside the cabin so what that means is your position within the aircraft will actually affect the volume of what you hear if you're directly under a speaker it will be louder if you move away from the speakers it will get a little quieter now it's quite a subtle effect but if you listen out for it you should be able to catch it we've also tied the pa system into a bunch of the systems of the aircraft primarily electrical so the audio that you're hearing will cut out or stutter when power is interrupted. This happens on the rail plane, now it happens on Phoenix too. So if you switch from the APU generators to the engine generators during startup, there's a little pause, there's a little bit of a stutter. And I think that's a little cool uh, extra effect that, that's thrown in there. Now, of course, it's all well and good when you are sat in the cabin and you can hear all of these announcements, but you'll be spending most of your time in the cockpit and this is kind of important because what we've done is we've made it such that the cockpit door will also actually affect the volume of what you hear when you're sat there preparing your flight and the cockpit door is closed this audio is going to be kind of muffled it's going to be a little quiet you're not really going to be able to hear it much if you open the cockpit door however of course the audio will come flooding into the cockpit and you'll be able to hear all the things that are going on in the background now, if you prefer to keep the cockpit door closed, but you do want to hear some of what is going on, you can use the ACP PA receive knob. So that's been built in as well with adjustable volume, so you can kind of set it how you like it. There's a bit of randomness in the announcement timings as well. So not everything will play at the same moment for every single flight that you do. Um, just a little bit of an extra factor to kind of simulate the cabin crew going about their jobs at different times. All of this stuff is completely community modifiable. So you can go out and build your own sound pack. You can add it to the aircraft and it will play whatever it is you want. More importantly, this stuff is selectable on a livery basis. So you can build a sound pack for EasyJet and you can have it play when you select an EasyJet livery. This is based around the ATC airline or ICAO airline in the aircraft.cfg of the livery. And this means that you can have dozens of sound packs installed for dozens of different liveries all at the same time. And it should all just work relatively seamlessly. 
the final little bit to cover here is that there is synchronization built in with the eCam as well. So we've tried to give you as many options as possible for all the various airline SOPs that exist and also the various airline options. This is kind of specific to the cabin ready memo uh, that you get on the eCam. Some airlines, the eCam is dynamic, so the cabin crew presses a button and you get a notification on the eCam that goes from cabin check to cabin ready or whatever it may be. Some airlines have an eCam which will notify you when the cabin is ready. Others will have a reminder instead. So you get a call from the cabin crew uh, when they're ready to go. Both options are now available to you, but there is also a third option where you can have cabin ready on the eCam and a call from the crew. So you can match this to whatever airline it is that you are simulating. Of course, this entire system is fully automatic, so you don't really have to do anything for it. It will just be going on in the background. And if you don't want it at all, you can just switch it off. Now, what's cool is that this is going to work in conjunction with our new full GSX integration. Now, what do I mean by full GSX integration? Well, everything should be covered from start to finish when it comes to turnarounds and whatnot. So you have progressive refueling, which will occur automatically based on the uplink that you have from the EFB. There is automatic boarding. So after refueling, boarding will begin. We've also given you some options here with how you'd like to do it. Some airlines will let you refuel while passengers are boarding and others will not. The announcement system is also tied into this, which means that you can have different announcements for when you have people boarding, but refueling is going on in which they will say, leave your seatbelts unfastened. Whereas in other airlines where you're not permitted to board people while you're refueling the aircraft, you will just get the normal boarding music and announcements. You also have automatic pushback and when you set the parking brake and the beacon light is turned on, the GPU will be disconnected, chocks removed and pushback requested from GSX. You will be prompted for the pushback direction because we can't really detect where you want to go, but this is about as good as we could get it. When you're done with your flight and you arrive on to stand with the parking brake set and the beacon light turned off, the GPU and chocks will be connected and deboarding will automatically begin. Of course, all the doors for passenger and cargo are opened and closed automatically. You shouldn't need to manually control these. And we will continue to look to make improvements in this area in the future with more interaction between the aircraft's A cars and the various ground services. But for now, everything should be handled for you if you're using GSX automatically and in conjunction with the PA system. So elsewhere in and around the EFB, while the entire thing may look broadly similar and pretty familiar to you, what you're looking at is EFB version two. So everything under the hood is brand new. We've rewritten the whole thing. And along with it, you're going to get some improvements to your quality of life, along with a bunch of new features, additions, and the usual tinkering that we like to do. The first quality of life thing that was very important to us was making it responsive. The old EFB wasn't as responsive as we'd have liked, and so we've improved that and made it much snappier to use. It's also not just snappy, but there's also persistence within the apps. So when you switch from one app to the other, it will remember where you were and take you back there when you next open the app. Now, a small quality of life thing that we've also added is the ability for you to change your background. Obviously, this one may be not so recommended for everybody, but you can set it to whatever you want to. And I was forced to use this by Dave who said he wouldn't edit this video if I didn't use it and I don't know how to edit videos so here we are. We've of course not just looked at the EFB itself but also the external EFB which is now optimized for more screen sizes which I know is something a lot of people have been asking for. For those of you that do use your EFB within the flight deck itself though we also have added the ability for you to use keyboard inputs. 
Now, another one of the things that was frequently requested was the airports and runways being updated to match whatever is latest. So in that light, what we ended up doing was changing the EFB data to now use Navigraph for your airports and runways, which means that you should have a fairly updated set of airports and runways within your various performance apps. The Navigraph app itself has now been updated and features their new AMDB charts, so you get a better resolution on the ground when you're at an airport that supports this. Back to performance calculations, there's also a new custom intersection functionality. So a lot of people were requesting that we update the intersection data for specific airports. And while we can't do it for every airport on earth, what we were able to do was give you the ability to define your own intersection. We've also added the ability for you to send your takeoff performance calculations directly to the MCDU. So you don't need to key all of that in yourself if you don't want to. This also applies to your zero fuel weight, your CG and your block fuel on your init page. Finally, a couple of little other things. We've added a QRH for both the IAE and the CFMs in the documents, and we have added a new failures app, and we've moved that entire UI out of the MCDU and put it in the EFB. Obviously, the MCDU was not a great UI to do all of this stuff with, so now you get a bigger screen and a much nicer way to go break the airplane if you want. You can filter by arm failures and failed systems, and it just gives you a much better overview of what you're dealing with. You'll also notice a bunch of new options available for you to tinker with, but we'll start by talking about one of the important ones, which is called SDS. So what's SDS? SDS is side stick damping simulation. SDS includes a reactivity and damping simulation to emulate the dynamics of the real side stick and to try and translate those as best as possible to your joystick at home. Now the real side stick is heavily damped and super sturdy. It would be kind of impossible to recreate fully the dynamics of using this on a home desktop joystick, but SDS aims to bring it slightly closer. Now opinions are going to vary, which is why this is turned off by default, and if it is off, it has no effect and aircraft handling will be relatively similar to before the update. If you turn it on, we have a set of recommended sensitivities to use and we'll make sure to include these in the documentation. What SDS should do is make the entire experience of flying the aircraft much smoother, so you'll feel a little bit more inertia and a little bit more weight behind the side stick. Moving on to the actual flight model itself, we've changed quite a lot about it. Now, we've built some tools around making this as accurate as possible, and one of the things that we did in beta was build a telemetry system, a live telemetry system as it were, where we're effectively mapping every data point we could possibly think of, uh, such as drag, N1, pitch, etc. And we've used that to basically tune against the OEM data that we had available to us. And as a result of that, we've adjusted quite a lot about the flight model and the way that it flies, including the airframe drag, uh, the various flap pitch settings, flap drag, so on and so forth. In theory, this should give you a much more accurate flight model now that flies on the numbers. One of the things this was super helpful for was tuning VNAV. So we were able to use this to tune uh, the idle descent angles and the idle descent performance of the aircraft and we were able to bring this into our VNAV code so that the aircraft descends on idle much nicer. Of course, ultimately speaking, the VNAV on the A320 is good, but it's not great. So you're going to end up in situations where your speed may vary a little bit. It also depends on the winds that you've uplinked and the real winds that are present where you are. So bear in mind, it's not going to be perfect, but it's not supposed to be. We've also used this on deceleration points on the vertical pathing, so in theory the aircraft should be reasonably accurate with how long it needs to decelerate to a specific speed. Again, this is not perfect on the rail thing and it's not going to be perfect here either, but it is much closer than it was on the build that you're using right now. One of the important things that the telemetry was used for were the flaps. So in the build that you have at the moment or one of the older builds, the flap settings, specifically flap 3 and flap 4, would cause an incorrect pitch attitude in the aircraft. 
what we've done is we've used this telemetry and we've rewritten the flaps specific to drag and pitch effects and now you have a much more accurate picture of what flap 3 and flap full pitch should look like. One of the knock-on effects of this is flare mode. We've implemented flare mode as is on the rail aircraft but what that meant was when you were approaching the runway with an incorrect pitch attitude as a result of the errors in flap 3 and flap full you weren't getting as much nose down input as you should have. Now that the pitch attitude has been corrected, there is a difference in flare mode, but it's not anything we've done. It's just a difference in what the actual software is choosing to do. It makes it harder to float forever and flap three will also have a much stronger nose down input because your pitch angle is much higher at 50 feet. So all in, the flight model has received a lot of love. Hopefully you'll be able to see and feel the differences when you get the update by yourself, but we're pretty happy with the way that it's performing at the moment. Right, okay, let's get to some meat and potatoes, um, the external engine model. It's been a really interesting journey trying to build this thing, and I know it's kind of easy to get caught up thinking that this whole thing was built just for the IAEs. In reality, it's a lot more than that. The whole purpose behind it and the real challenge with it was making it agnostic to the aircraft. That means that we can apply this thing to any engine and any aircraft that we build down the line. In a way, I kind of look at it as both a time and resource investment in solidifying our current and future products. Now, obviously, it's taken quite a while. Um, this was a tough strategic call. But then again, there really isn't a how-to manual when it comes to building something like this. It's more or less just wild and uncharted territory. I mean, there's literally no documentation and we're completely on our own. What that effectively means is intensive R&D. It's not just how to either. And it's important that running this thing on your computer doesn't cause nuclear meltdowns. To make sure that it ran okay, we designed and redesigned the infrastructure several times over. It's been a really strong test of what we're capable of doing, but now that we're at the tail end of it, I'm quite pleased at the result. I think the engines sort of feel alive. I mean, oil literally flows through the veins in the heart of the engine that oil carries heat as it passes through, affecting its viscosity. And all of this create knock-on effects everywhere. Cold oil is thick and delivers high oil pressure with poor backflow. Once it's warmed up though, the pressure drops a little bit and backflow improves, but more importantly, the measurable volume increases as a result. So you can do things like compare the oil between different engine operation speeds and see that it yields different results. You might even see it fluctuate during the course of a flight. We did actually compare tech logs from the rail aircraft against the external engine model to see how it was doing and it was surprisingly close. The entire system breeds with the airplane and it's really really cool to see. It's not just stuff going on inside the engine either. The engines actually also respond to the world around you and perhaps this is slightly scary but they also respond to being mishandled. They have quirks and limitations that you do best to familiarize yourself with, knowing that if you don't, you're probably going to end up in a nasty situation. You can damage an engine by letting the compressor stall repeatedly without pulling the power, reducing your net thrust. Eventually, the engine's going to flame out, and depending on how abused it is, it may not want to start again. Go far enough trying to break the thing with fire and heat, and you can actually core lock it. We built all of this from 158,137 data points per engine variant. Funnily enough, that kind of sort of works out to around 320,000 data points across both models. And very importantly, these are actually from live service engines. So it's not just book figures for a perfect brand new engine. This data and the infrastructure behind it allowed us to achieve really dynamic behavior that far surpasses what we're able to do with the native platform. It's not all about the data points, but also the dynamic interpolation between them, and above all the simulation and tuning variables that we account for. Like I said before, building the infrastructure for this was a mammoth task, as was making it performant. 
We feel like there's a little bit more on the table for optimization, but it currently nets out to be similar to the version on your PC right now, which we're pretty happy with overall. Anyway, that's enough yapping on about the whole thing. I could literally be here for hours and not really scratch the surface of this thing. So instead, why don't we just go and explore some of the dynamic situations that you might find yourself in soon. So you join me on a scorching New Delhi summer's day. Not a cloud in the sky and the temperature is about 42 degrees Celsius. We've just brought this aircraft in from Mumbai and the passengers are currently deboarding. We're going to turn the aircraft around and head back out of here. And the average turnaround on one of the larger A320 carriers that visits New Delhi is around 30 to 35 minutes. So we'll try to stick to that. Okay, around 35 minutes in, the tug is hooked up. Let's start the pushback and proceed as normal. Right, so here we're going to see something interesting. I'll explain as we go along and hopefully you can follow as best as possible, but this whole scenario is best described as a little quirk of the IAEs. We're on the pushback now, so let's just proceed with the engine start. Assume we've followed all applicable checklists, but the one thing I like to do is just a quick glance up at the fuel pumps to ensure they're turned on, and another quick peek to make sure the APU bleed is also on. Everything looks good, so let's set engine mode selector to start, and let's set master lever 1 to on. Now, we observe the rise of the various parameters as the engine begins cranking. On the IAEs, there is a little extra technicality here. The engine itself has a lower transient temperature limit than the CFMs. It's about 635 degrees Celsius versus 725 degrees Celsius. Therefore, what the FADEC will do here is attempt to cool the engine off with an extended crank period. The rules are it'll begin ignition at or below 250 degrees Celsius, or if the crank has exceeded 150 seconds, whichever is first. You may notice that the moment the engine started cranking, the temperature actually went up a little bit before dropping back down. As N1 and N2 begin rotating for the start process, they begin driving air through and around the core, slowly driving compressed and core heated air back towards the EGT probe. We're effectively displacing warm air back and out through the engine before replacing it with fresh air that we're pulling in from the front. This leads to a gentle spike in EGT reading before N1 and N2 begin picking up speed and the volume of fresh cold air being ingested by the engine overcomes the immediate heating and cools both the core and the EGT probe, depending on the temperature. Today it's quite hot, so it's cooling just a little bit slower. So as we can see, we've hit either 150 seconds or the EGTs drop below 250 and the fuel is introduced, starting the ignition process. And there's the little quirk. Now, I'll explain more in a second, but first I'll quickly set the engine to dry crank before starting to talk about what's going on, as we'll be waiting for a little while during this process. So we set mode selector to crank, and we'll reach for the man start push buttons on the overhead and push for engine one. Right, there's us cranking the engine, and we're going to do this for two minutes, so I've pushed the chrono in. We'll just keep an eye on what's going on while we talk about what on earth just happened. As I said before, this is one of the operational quirks of the IAE. This engine has a lower transient temperature limit, which has a very interesting effect on its auto start behavior when it's really hot outside. Now, this is not an absolute. One thing we learned about engines in general is that behavior and performance will vary from engine to engine. Some may actually start, others may not. It depends on the engine, on the wing, on the day. This is much the same in Phoenix. This may or may not happen to you, but it is almost a certainty if you're pushing very short turnarounds in hot temperatures and the engine hasn't been allowed to cool off enough. So what actually happened? 
Well, the FADIC automatic start sequence protections kicked in there, and it actually aborted the start. It basically determines an overlimit in advance and on the basis of an internal schedule, so to speak. That means that when the OAT is exceptionally hot as it is today and turnaround time prohibits the engine from cooling off enough, the schedule is advanced and as EGT begins rising, it does so faster than the FADEC is expecting. This leads to a bit of a panic moment for the FADEC and it culminates in what is effectively an aborted start. This is common enough that Airbus have actually recommended to carriers frequently operating in these temperatures to ignore an auto start entirely if OAT exceeds 40 degrees and simply go for a manual start right off the bat. Now, when we open up the QRH for a manual start, we will see a note inside it that says in hot weather, OAT 40 degrees Celsius or above, if the residual EGT is above 100 degrees Celsius, perform a two minute dry crank in order to reduce the residual EGT to minimum achievable. Refer to supplement engine ventilation dry cranking. So we're going to do that. Given our EGT is above 100 degrees Celsius and the OAT is above 40, we've pulled up the engine ventilation supplement and followed that before we actually get back to starting the engine. It's a very simple procedure as you can see and you may spot the initial note which says this procedure can be used on the ground after an unsuccessful automatic start not followed by an automatic dry crank. Well, we did have an automatic dry crank, but the purpose of this note is to state that it's used for removing fuel vapors before commencing a manual start if the engine hasn't auto cranked itself. In Phoenix, the adverse effects of not removing the fuel vapors if accumulated is indeed modeled. So you can cause a pretty spicy start if you don't ventilate an engine when needed. In this case, it has removed the fuel vapors with an auto crank by itself, but we can still use it to cool the engine as this note is not exclusive to these situations only. So I stopped the crank while explaining all that at two minutes so we don't add some excess wear to the starter and or break it. The starter breaking itself isn't part of the simulation just yet, but we're looking to get into that later. We can see that the EGT's dropped a fair amount, but as we stop the cranking, it may climb ever so slightly as cool air stops flowing over the core and the core heat begins diffusing back towards the probe. There's a lot of complex thermodynamics and thermal exchanges going on here. All that aside though, let's just get started with lighting this engine up manually. We've given the starter about 15 seconds between engagement to lubricate itself, and now we can commence the start. So following along in the QRH, We've checked the thrust levers are at idle, and the engine mode selector is already in norm, so we'll go ahead and switch it to start. The FADEX come alive, and we'll look to the overhead and once again hit the engine manual start push button. Looking at the ECAM here, the start valve is in line. We have rising oil pressure and N2 is rising. We can skip a page on the procedure as N2 has already gone past 16%. If it doesn't, there are supplementary procedures, but it has, so we're just gonna move on to the next page. We're looking for maximum motoring speed, which we've now achieved, and we're happy with the EGT at the moment. So we'll go ahead and flip engine master lever one to on, and we'll hit the chrono at the same time. Looking at the ECAM, igniters A and B, both on and fuel is being introduced. Now, within the 20 second maximum, we see fuel flow increase, which is good, and N1 starting to come up. Next page here, N2 reaches 43%. We're checking for igniters off as so, and start valve above 43% is now showing a cross line. Main and secondary engine parameters all look relatively normal. We're gonna go ahead and switch off the manual start push button and set the mode selector to norm. So there you go, that's a manual start done. We do the same for the other engine, but at this point we'll just move on to the next demo. Something interesting worth noting here before we move on though is the N1 reading. 
Now, this is kind of an interesting one because there's actually a massive tolerance on the N1 reading for in-service engines. We're sort of kind of experimenting with engine aging, and this won't be in the version you have on your PC, but it's something we're interested in emulating. For the IAEs, these ones in particular, there's a negative 2.0 to plus 3.8 N1 tolerance from a baseline value. These engines here are a little older, so they run a touch hotter and burn just a smidge more fuel than a factory new engine. This value is within the tolerance for fuel flow N1, N2, and EGT. But I just thought it was something to note before someone throws the book at us. It's also important to remember that there are several variations of the IAEs fitted to the A320. So if this sort of N1 doesn't match a video you're watching, it's likely because these are V2527 A5 Select 1 engines. There is a Select 2 package that we're investigating, and that implements something called RGI, Reduce Ground Idle. But I can't confirm at the moment whether or not we're going to build this in the future just yet. Okay, so for our next demonstration, we find ourselves on a completely different end of the weather spectrum. It's a cold, miserable, and gloomy day here in Copenhagen. We've simulated a fascinating phenomenon that could well catch you out the next time you fly into these sorts of conditions. I've pushed the airplane back and taxied to the holding point here just short of the runway. It's taken me about 12 minutes to get here, taxiing nice and slowly thanks to the conditions. We've got a quartering headwind reported from right to left, nothing major, only around 15 knots or so, gusting up to 20. But sat here on the whole short line, it's a direct right to left crosswind. There's a decent chunk of precipitation, snow in this case, and the temperature is around minus 2 degrees Celsius, so it's quite slushy on the ground. What I'm now going to show you is called engine fan blade icing. So, in addition to the cowling and leading edge of the wing being critical to the safe operation of the aircraft in icing conditions, so are the fan blades. Now, with that being said, the cowling and the leading edge have anti-ice systems, but the fan blades do not. This leads to some potential pitfalls if you're not careful. We've modeled the effects of ice accumulation not only on the fan blades, but also on the cowling, which can cause vibrations. Fan blade icing is much more insidious, though. Instead of simply experiencing vibrations, when the fan blades ice up, we're looking at a loss of power and a very lazy engine. Now, the first part to understanding the issue is understanding the conditions it tends to occur in. A dry, extreme cold is not going to cause engine fan blade icing. An extreme cold with some blowing snow is probably a step up on the threat level, but the worst possible threat level for it is when you're closer to zero degrees Celsius in precipitation conditions or in conditions such as freezing fog, a freezing drizzle, or even rain at one degree Celsius. The next is to understand what actually happens. Now, in these conditions, ice can build up on the LPC blades, the LPC inlet guide vanes, and the fan exit guide vanes. The reduction in inlet area can lead to a reduced flow through the engine, which may have become choked. This choked flow would have limited high pressure compressor delivery, and hence the HPC delivery pressure controls fuel flow, and this leads to inadequate thrust production for a commanded power setting. Now, to be clear, it will only really accumulate in low power regimes, so whilst at idle during taxi or holding short, or even when you're turning the aircraft around and the engines are powered down. Thankfully, you got a couple of tools at your disposal to help deal with this. The first, when the engines are powered down, is a new option on the EFB ground services menu called fan blade heating. This, in reality, applies a heating unit to the intake and helps thaw out or keep warm the fan blades. There's no visual model for it yet, but it does work and it is a critical part to keeping safe in these conditions. The next, once you've departed from the comfort of the heating unit, is the ice shedding procedure, which you now do actually have a reason to do. On CFM, it's 70% N1 for 30 seconds. I recommend doing this every 15 minutes or so, and additionally at least once before you take off once you're lined up. Monitor your vibrations carefully on the lower ECAM and get proactive in dealing with the problem. On the IAEs as we have here today, it's 50% and one every 15 minutes minimum, so keep a good eye on the clock. The same rule applies, add a run up when you're lined up and ready to go too. As in the FCOM, doing this will help shed the accumulated ice safely before you apply any power and find yourself in a dicey situation. 
Just bear in mind you may need to apply more than a single run up every 15 minutes depending on how severe the weather and conditions are, so monitor engine response closely. You may even get away with less butt on your head be it. Just bear in mind it's entirely possible to accumulate so much ice you can't even get to the required N1 for shedding. Watch your vibration value while you're doing the shed, and if it's higher than normal but creeping downwards, you're actually successfully shedding ice. If you've accumulated so much ice you can't even shed it, then, well, you either go back to the gate and throw it out with the fan blade heating, or you do it with the magic of a weather change. Right, time for a practical demonstration on what not to do. You'll join me on the runway in just a second, and we'll take a peek at what this looks like. Okay, we're all lined up, ready to go. Now, I've opted to just ignore all my other advice. We were sitting back there on the whole short while I explained all this stuff to you and I ultimately forgot to do any run-ups. Now I've lined up, I'm focusing on the takeoff, and I'm not really paying attention to much else. So again, not doing any run-ups. On the taxi out of here, maybe I was busy with VATSIM or simply not getting lost in this horrific weather, so again, I forgot. We're cleared for takeoff and let's just advance the thrust levers. And yeah, look at that. So it's probably a good thing I'm stood on the brakes because that does not look very healthy. Now the question is, why just engine number two? Surely if it's icing, it's icing everything up. Have you cast your mind back to the whole short when I mentioned the wind conditions? You'll remember I said we had a quartering headwind from right to left. As it was though, on the whole short itself, the wind was a direct right to left crosswind due to the orientation of the aircraft. And what ended up happening was poor old engine number two was sat out there in the wind, cold, and elements, while engine number one was actually being shielded by the fuselage, and therefore it did not have a bunch of precipitation blowing into it. We take all of this stuff into consideration. It's pretty fascinating to be honest, because the same exact thing occurred to an A320 in something like 2004 or 5. In that incident, it took a grand total of six minutes on the whole short to accumulate enough ice in engine number one such that when they applied takeoff power, the asymmetric thrust effect was so strong that the aircraft deviated from the runway at 22 knots and they couldn't recover it. So they ended up in a field next to the runway. This is some pretty scary stuff and in that situation, the crew didn't ice shed the engines. Now in MSFS, I think you've got to worry about it too. All right, final one as this video is starting to get very long and I'd quite like to get some sleep. Um, we're here in Edinburgh, it's wet, it's windy, and it's kind of wild. We'll keep this one short as I think this phenomenon is quite well understood. We've got a massive crosswind, 45 to 50 knots blowing from left to right, well outside of aircraft limitations and I shouldn't really be here. But in the words of William Ernest Henley, I am the master of my fate, I am the captain of my soul, and I am the captain of this damn airplane, so I've decided we're going anyway. Everything all set, let's stand on the brakes and apply a bit of power. Ah, yeah, that sounded kind of expensive, um, and it also probably scared the life out of most people in the back. What you saw there was a compressor stall. Same exact logic as icing when it comes to why it occurred on engine 1 and not engine 2, because engine 1 is the one hanging out in the wind this time. Engine 2 is nicely shielded by the fuselage. Now a compressor stall is not super common unless you really abuse the engine and take the aircraft way past its limits, both crosswind or tailwind. You see I've had to add crazy winds here to incite it. It's actually relatively rare, and if you're sticking to the aircraft's crosswind limits, you're probably never going to see one, unless you've damaged the engine prior and it's already clinging on to dear life. Why does this actually happen though? Well, the engine, when it's running at power in relatively normal conditions, the air traveling into the intake does so in something called a laminar flow. Smooth, in other words. When you're throwing a crosswind or tailwind into the mix, that smooth air into the engine becomes turbulent and messy. The compressor does not like turbulent air and it will promptly throw a little fit, much like the one you've seen here. Now when this happens, just roll the power back to idle smoothly and perhaps wait until you're not in a 50 knot crosswind to take off. Maybe see if you can find a headwind or at the very least a quartering headwind to have a go. 
But the question is, what happens if you're just going to let the engine continue with its compressor stalled? So I've reapplied a bit of power here. And finally, there goes the engine. It's flamed out. Now, you've damaged it, and it's basically shut down. It should be recoverable in this state, so you'll be able to relight it. But ultimately speaking, keep doing this a few times, and the damage will be far too severe to continue. You may even overheat the engine, which is going to cause you a whole different set of problems. Consequences for your actions, I suppose. There's a whole host of other stuff that can cause compressor stalls or surges, including letting ice accumulate on the engine cowling, so be wary of that too. Sometimes a bird strike will cause a hiccup and the engine may well just eat it and be susceptible to some compressor stalls. So that leads you to run it in a lower or idle power setting. Sometimes a bird strike will absolutely shred the engine. We've added a little bit of randomness to that failure now, so good luck with that. And have fun with it. Anyway, that about wraps it up. I hope you've enjoyed this deep dive into some of the system stuff that we've built for Block 2. I really do look forward to you all getting this on your computers. This bozo is about to close out the video. It's not actually done yet. Watch this. Okay, so like I totally forgot about a couple of important things. Before I went and wrapped up the video um, that I was sort of supposed to say. But cut me some slack. It's been a long day. It's been a long month. It's been a long year. Um, but I think the first thing that we all wanted to say pretty much here on the team we're really sorry for the delays. I know it's not been fun. It's not been fun for you. It's not been fun for us. Um, but ultimately, from our side, we have an objective. And that objective is to build this into the best A320 simulation out there. And we really wanted to give the 321 and the 319 the best base possible. And that meant that we needed to basically overhaul and upgrade the core product. I know that taking this long for an external engine model, yes, you saw three effects. Um, taking a year to do three effects isn't really what has happened. It's a gut rebuild and general infrastructure work to support the really tiny details of this engine model. Um, like I said, things like oil viscosity, dilation, all that sort of stuff is modeled. I just haven't shown it to you here, but I'm sure if you have a keen eye you will notice it we're trying to bring you every little millimeter of detail uh, with this engine model but it's also gonna serve us into the future with our future aircraft products like this -uh. um, like the 321 319 you know like all the other stuff that we have coming down the pipe um, it means a lot to us that we continue to have the support of a lot of our customers like i said a year long to develop this you guys have been really patient and uh it's it's been tough it's been tough for all of us uh but ultimately that reinvestment you know it goes into the 1921 like i said we wanted to support the core of the product to be as strong as possible we wanted to give you guys this update or upgrade for free because looking at the 321 319 we weren't happy leaving the 320 a product that's out there and that's already been purchased by a bunch of people we weren't happy leaving that in the state that it was and then moving forward on the next paid thing you know as much as we are a business and we have to survive we're doing fine we can afford to make this decision and we did because that's what we're all about i guess and uh yeah i mean from our perspective you know the last year 2023 um the entirety of 2023 we have reinvested pretty much every single penny we got from sales um so i don't think we'll be taking much profit out of 2023 but i do believe that we've really done right by the product uh and that we have done right by the 321 and the 319 because both of those are going to be better products as a result of this you know they're being built off this basis and work on those is going really well um so hopefully you should see those before not too long now the other couple of things i wanted to talk about kind of important to some of you um maybe less important to rest the first is more of like a service announcement we've also built a web mcdu i haven't featured it because i 
kind of forgot, but but it's there. There's a web MCDU now. You can use it. It's linked up to the MCDU in the airplane. Uh, ben, one of the new guys we brought on, who is our CTO, he put that together, uh, mostly because he wanted it, so he went out and built it. Um, and I think a lot of people are going to be happy about that because they've had to go elsewhere or externally to use a web MCDU, but now you, you got it natively supported. So that's great. Number two, and I think people are going to be, or some people are going to be quite happy with this. After like a solid year or maybe longer of negotiation and talking and discussing, we've come to an agreement with the fine folks down at ProSim and we are going to unlock hardware support for people that want to use stuff like mini FCUs and whatnot. This has involved a little bit of a change to our licensing agreement that we have with them. We will eat that cost. We will we will eat it. Just go be happy and do your mini FCU things or whatever else hardware you got. Um, this may not come with block two. We're still kind of we we've come to an agreement. I got to do the paperwork, and I'm hoping to do the paperwork by the time block two releases. I expect I'll do the paperwork by the time block two releases. But if I don't, it'll come quite likely in pretty much the first update after block two. And that brings me to my third point. Waiting this long between updates kind of sucks. I know. Um, once block two is out, I think we'll get back to kind of regularly scheduled programming. This has been a massive project to undertake. But I think you can look forward to more regular updates to the product. Um, we hear you. I know there are a lot of people that are upset that some bugs haven't been solved in like four or five, six months, something like that. Yeah, I agree. That kind of sucks. Um, we'll fix that. So we will do more regular updates now that we're done with this behemoth of a, of a, pro a project. Now that we're done with this behemoth of a project, we will fix that. So we will start giving you more regular updates. And I think that's it. I think now I can say I hope you enjoyed the video and that this is probably the end, but Dave might yell at me for something else. So there might be a additional thing to this. I don't know. We'll see. If not, thanks for watching and I hope to see you guys soon.